Welcome to Authors at Drucker. I'm Dave Specht, Director of the Global Family Business Institute at uh, the Peter Drucker School of Management. Um, at the Drucker School, we aspire to become the global meeting place for the world's most influential business-owning families. And today's conversation with Kathy represents our progress in achieving that objective. Authors at Drucker is an interview series uh, where we feature top authors that write about issues impacting business-owning families. Authors at Drucker is made possible from the generous sponsorship of the James E. Hughes Jr. Foundation. Jay's joining us today. Thanks again, Jay. The foundation is dedicated to advancing the study of family governance and generational well-being. We at the Drucker School feel very aligned and very grateful to Jay and his foundation. On the last Authors at Drucker, we featured a book called Selfless, Lessons Learned uh, from a Life Devoted to Servant Leadership. And I interviewed Len Jessup, who is the former president of Claremont Graduate University. If you missed that session, please feel free to check it out on our website or on our YouTube channel. Uh, before we get to Kathy, I wanted to just share a couple of announcements about things that are coming up. Um, we are beginning to schedule uh, with institutions um, some some certificate programs, and one of those is a certificate in advising family enterprises. Uh, this certificate was developed for advisors to really be able to serve families at the intersection of the financial and non-financial lives that they're leading. And it's really focused on um, elevating and enhancing the experience of families as they are being advised. So if you or your institution is interested in learning more about that, please feel free to reach out to me. And we also have our Generational Wealth Masterclass, which is uh, has been used in Uganda and in other parts of the world We'll be taking some of that content to Brazil and to Uruguay. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, the Generational Wealth Masterclass content, again, please feel free to shoot me an email or pick up the phone. And finally, we're going to get to our, our guest today. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen. And today's guest on Authors at Drucker is Kathy Carroll. Kathy's the founder and president of Legacy Onward. Kathy's a family business leadership coach. Kathy earned certificates in both leadership coaching and executive facilitation at Georgetown University. She's an MBA at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and a BA at Boston College. She's also a professional certified coach in the ICF. Kathy's author of Hug of War, which we're going to be featuring today, How to Lead a Family Business with Both Love and Logic. Kathy, welcome to Authors at Drucker. Thank you, Dave. So nice to be here. So first of all, congratulations on this this recent launch of your book. I know it's probably, I, I feel like you're omnipresent, Kathy, because I, I see you're everywhere, which is uh, probably what happens with the launch of a book. I love the title, Hug of War. Um, I have my copy here, and I know that there are others joining joining us today that already have their copies. So um, congratulations on, on the book launch. Thank you. Um, there are some concepts in here that I feel like are are new and um, are really helpful for me particularly. So if, if one if there's only one person you impacted, it, it's me. Uh, so I appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about polarities. You spend a lot of time in the book talking about polarities. Can you talk about what those are and why they're so helpful with navigating business complexity? Yes. So polarities are, I'm going to get wonky for a second, and then I promise we'll get more interesting later, but polarities are interdependent opposing forces. So okay. think at the most basic level, a, a human polarity that we all manage every day is inhale and exhale. They're interdependent because an inhale doesn't exist without an exhale and vice versa. And they're opposing forces, right? An inhale is the opposite of an exhale. So the, at, its, at its very basic level, uh, polarities are interdependent opposites. It, like same and different would be a polarity. Wet and dry would be a polarity. And what's important to know, uh, there are a lot of things, but one important thing to know about polarities is that every hole on a polarity has upsides and overuses. And so when you're thinking about a polarity, we often get caught in this, should I do this or this? 
And when you're facing a polarity, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. You need a different set of skills to navigate a polarity because there's no right answer to an either or question when you're facing a polarity. I love it. I love, I love the first thing that you said, you know, the inhale and exhale, because you know what I'm really a fan of inhaling and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to die on the hill. I'm an inhaler. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I love, I love the, I love that first example that you shared. Um, so let's dig into a couple more um, just to get the conversation started. You talk about polarities as, as something that can't be solved, but they need to be managed. Tell us more about kind of what you mean by that. Cause I love the reframing of, you know, families don't necessarily have problems. They have polarities. Yes. Tell us more about that. Yes. So the one that I think is really simple to share is the concept of uh, tradition and innovation. That's a very common tension in a family business. And, uh, quite often we get stuck in the question of, should we honor tradition or should we innovate? And if you think about uh, tradition and innovation as a polarity, you hold the tension between these opposing forces a little bit differently. And when you map it out and you say, well, what are the benefits of tradition? And what happens if we only honor tradition? What are the benefits of innovation? What happens if we only innovate? And you start to see the upsides and downsides or benefits and overuses of each one. And that allows you to completely change how you engage with the challenge. And the quick and dirty answer is you try to think creatively about how do you get the benefits of tradition and the benefits of innovation. And it's one of the reasons why um, polarity thinking is often called both and thinking. You're replacing this either or mindset, which is how our brains are wired. We are, as human beings, we're trained to think in either or, and it takes a little while to develop the, the perspective of being able to hold both of these opposing forces to have value and to be true. Well, and I, I, the language I think is so important too, because I think we get into positions and if you take a position of traditional or a position of innovative, then you're rigid and there's not, there's not the flexibility to grow. And so I feel like you're giving us, you're giving us new language, new kind of permission to, to not have to necessarily take a position, but to look at a spectrum and to look at, um, a, you know, adjusting and, and where the benefits come from, from being, being flexible and, and malleable. Uh, um, you talk about uh, the principle of harmonizing poles, and you alluded to it just a second ago with using both and thinking. Uh, not everyone is familiar with that. If, if you could just kind of break that down a little bit and let us know why why is harmonize, why are ha harmonizing poles so crucial, and, and tell us a little bit more about this both and thinking. Sure. So for this example, I'm going to use one that's very, very common in estate planning. And that's the tension between reveal and conceal. And I'm actually going to give a nod to Jamie on the on the call here today because he's the first person who introduced me to that concept, this reveal conceal. And so what what I propose is that reveal and conceal is a classic polarity. And instead of asking the question, should we reveal our estate plan to our children or should we conceal our estate plan uh, from our children, uh, we rethink the question and say, well, what are the upsides of revealing? What are the upsides of concealing? And then what might we choose to do differently over the course of time that gets the benefits of both? Now, when our children are really young, we might not re reveal the full plan. We might not reveal dollar amounts. We might instead talk about family values and the things that are important to us. And then maybe in our teens, we might reveal a little bit more about the structure. We still may not reveal dollar amounts. We may. It depends on the, on the circumstances of the family. As the children mature, we start to get more specific and we start to see the value of actually sharing some of this information. Um, with the next generation over time. So I like that one as an example because you can't answer the question. It, it's, it's not an either or question because if you get if you get stuck in either or thinking, you're only going to focus on reveal, which could have some problems really if you only reveal. And, and if you only focus on conceal, you could have some real problems that arise in the family. So again, it's reframing the question to how do you get the best of both? And the answer may change over time because you're a dynamic system. Families are dynamic. The business is dynamic. The circumstances are going to change over time. Well, and I just think about my own, my own children and their development. And 
what they're ready to hear and how it gets presented is, is everything. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean I'm a concealer if I'm not going to tell my six-year-old everything about, you know, what they're going to experience in their life and what they should expect. It just means that, you know, there's, there's a, you know, there's an order, there's, uh, you know, there's a process to that. So I like that. Um, you talked about, um, this is connected to polarities. You talk about mindset and in the book, you talk about business mindset versus family mindset. Um, and maybe this is, uh, the tug of war uh, Mm -hmm. or the hug of war that, that you're really getting into, but can you talk about maybe your experience with families that, you know, kind of state, well, we're a, we're a business first family or we're a family first family. And when they kind of plant that flag, what, what are the imp- what implications of those sorts of statements? And, and uh, just talked about business mindset versus family mindset. Yeah. Well, there's a lot in that. A lot so, in that. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. I'll, uh, I'll try to weave it all together. Uh, so the family business I propose is a polarity. Now, is it a polarity in nature? No. Can you have a business without a family? Sure. Can you have a family without a business? Sure. But if you're in a family business, you are managing the tension between these two mindsets. And there's rules associated or norms associated with each mindset. So in the family mindset, the norms are sharing and fairness and unconditional belonging. In the business mindset, the norms are profits and competition and meritocracy. Those are in opposition. So when you're leading a family business, you suddenly get faced with these challenges like, okay, I've got to make a decision here. If I use the family mindset, I get this answer. If I use the business mindset, I get this answer. What am I going to do? Yeah. And I'll give you a really um, a really emotional example. Uh, this is a, a, a recent client situation. This is a rising generation leader who's in his 40s and he's leading the business and his brother-in-law just lost his job. So his mom said, you got to hire him. You got to hire, you got to hire the brother. Well, the business brain says, my brother-in-law is not qualified and I don't have an open Mm -hmm. position, right? Yeah. Family says, I got to look out for family. This is my sister's husband. I got to take, I got to figure out a way to help. And so you've got these two right answers in your head. And it's like this uh, cognitive dissonance that results. It's very, very challenging because there's value in both mindsets. Um, another reason why I think this is so important is because every person just by nature of how we are born and wired in life has a pull preference. So some of, some of us prefer one pull, the family mindset. Some of us prefer the other pull, the business mindset. And until we realize that we're in a polarity, we don't know how to hold the tension between these opposing things. So another example that I like to use is this invest and harvest in a family business. When you have profits in the family business, the the question is always, well, what do we invest back into this business? What do we harvest from the business? That is a tension. And quite often you have family members, right? You've got a system, you've got a family system and you have some family members who are adamant. We need to reinvest in the business, right? It's the right thing to do. This is a business. We need to reinvest. And then we have family members who are arguing, we need to harvest, I don't have a relationship with this. I'm I'm a millionaire on paper, but I have no relationship with this business. I have no dividends that I, I'm not connected to it. There's value in harvesting the business. There's value in simply just diversifying your investment portfolio, et cetera. So when you get these really strongly held beliefs and, and you hold them as an either or, you just put force against force and you get stuck. When you're able to hold it as a polarity and you start to define what are the upsides of investing? What are the overuses of investing? What are the upsides of harvesting, the overuses of harvesting? You start to hold the nuance and the subtleties of this question a little bit differently. In the absence of that, what you end up is one faction argues the upsides of harvesting and the overuses of investing. And the other side argues the upside of investing, the overuses of harvesting. And you just argue the diagonals. You may be familiar with this if you ever listen to C-SPAN. Right? This is what happens in our government all day long. The liberals argue the upside of liberal ideology, the overuses of conservative and vice versa. So um, that's why I think it's so incredibly important because it, when you hold it as a polarity, you can normalize 
the tension and you can transcend the conflict. Well, and I think about, you know, if a, if a board or if a, uh, you know, an advisory board or even a family council has this kind of perspective on polarities, then you can take away, you know, the natural inclination to have individuals representing certain parties. You know, I'm on here to represent my family line or I'm, but if there is that polarity thinking, that polarity mindset, you know, that, that can maybe remove or, or dampen at least some of the, uh, you know, some of that, uh, some of that thinking. Yeah. Well said. Um, so early in the book, you talk about a couple of concepts I want to dig into. Um, the first one, you talk about domain crossover. Um, what is domain crossover and and how how does it show up? Yeah, domain crossover is such a unique power dynamic in a family business. I'll define it as follows. It's when you use power in one domain, like the family domain, to an exact to exact a result you want in the business domain, or vice versa, you want you use power in the business domain to exact a result in the family domain. And I'll give you two quick examples. Um, worked with a client, uh, Max, uh, who's who got demoted by his father because Max didn't invite his father's new wife to his son's bris, mm-hmm. and. The father said, look, you need to make nice with my wife. And until you make nice with my wife, you are not advancing in this company. So the father exercised power in the business domain to get what he wanted in the family domain, right? Another example, this is a different client. Um, There was a father and a son. The father had taken over a portion of the business, but not all of it. And the son said, I want to take over all of this business. And until you give me full reigning authority over this business, you are not going to see your grandchildren. It's an example of using power in the business domain to exact an outcome in the family domain. This doesn't exist outside of family business, right? Because you don't have these two, this duality of domains. Like I couldn't go into my stepson's school and say, I want you to give him an A. I mean, well, these days people try, but it's really outside of what's appropriate in many ways, but in the family business domain, that happens all the time. Yeah. And again, I think these principles and, and naming them uh, and just creating awareness can allow people to just see what, what they're living through. doesn't necessarily mean that there are specific answers to how they navigate domain crossover, but if they're seeing it for what it is, they can at least name it and then be able to to discuss it or at least be able to you know manage through it that way i think just being able to name it itself can be powerful enough because it gives you a chance to step back and look at it from a different lens because a lot of times it's being used unconsciously and i i talk about there's actually some great value in using this what i call hard power or power over when it's coming from a place of love like if my grandchild is running across the street, I'm going to use hard power to pull her to safety so that she doesn't get run. Right. That's coming from a place of, uh, of love and protection. Um, when hard power is used, uh, from a place of fear, it can be really problematic. It's not sustainable. It creates really disruptive emotional dynamics. It's not scalable. Uh, and so when it comes from a place of fear, it's usually very destructive. And I also talk about a few strategies about when you're on the receiving end of hard power, uh, how, how to muddle through, but we can save that for an, another conversation. Yeah. Well, and just for our listeners on the call today, I mean, I would encourage teaching and giving this vocabulary, whether whether you are in a family business or you're an advisor, like the time to give families this kind of language about domain power and about um, shadow influencers, like the time to give them that language is when they're not in active conflict. Um, If you give this language to families and they have an awareness, then when there is active conflict, then there is, there's material to work with. Um, Anyways, that's my, that's my plug. But um, I I want to talk a little bit about um, shadow influencers. Again, these are concepts that unless you're like living in a family business, uh, like someone that is working in a, public company, 
shadow influencers, you know, probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense or the domain crossover doesn't really apply to them. So talk to us a little bit about shadow influencers and, um, and why they sometimes have so much power. Shadow influence is when there's a person in the system who may not have any ownership in the business, may not have any employment in the business, yet is able to wield undue power in the business. And I'll give an example here. So I write about BB, uh, who is the chief operating officer of a business, and uh, they the family decided to hire a new head of sales. And this new head of sales is kind of known to be a partier. And the CEO, Francie, was a recovering alcoholic, and she so she was in treatment for substance abuse. And her husband said, "Oh no, 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 no." We're not going to have this new hire reporting to my wife. That's a slippery slope. And so we're going to solve this problem and we are going to elevate our son to be the president of this company. And we're going to put a layer between Francie and BB, the chief operating officer. And so this son, who's talented, really capable, uh, and I would call him high potential in the sort of traditional leadership development space, um, got promoted to president a little early, you know, a little premature, um, and uh, and is about 12 to 15 years younger than BB. And BB went bananas. How dare they promote this young person ahead of BB without even telling BB? He's on the board. Why didn't he know this? This all happened on the family side, right? And why, how on earth did he not know about this? And then more importantly, why wasn't he considered? for that role. Like he kind of thought he was a candidate for the president role. And so it was really derailing to him. And after about, I don't know, six or nine months, uh, he ended up getting let go because he could not wrap his head around what was going on. And it influenced in a very negative way, how he showed up in the business. Now that's shadow influence, right? You have the husband of the CEO who was trying to protect the family from a really bad family outcome that had a profound impact on the business. BB had no idea what was happening. He never saw it coming, right? He got completely blindsided. Still doesn't know uh, what happened to him, but lost his job because of that kind of shadow influence. And again, this soft power can be a force for good as much as it can be a force for, for bad. In some respects, uh, there's another story I could tell, but um, that's a force for good, but we'll save that for another time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it feels like there needs to be some measurement tools developed around, you know, for a family system. And so there's some some spotting that can go on. And also, um, yeah, anyways, I think I think you're definitely you're definitely on to some things here. Uh, well, before you move on from that, um, I, I don't really talk about this very much, but I think it's worth sharing. I do have in the back of the book an, a QR code to an assessment you can take that actually it, there are four different polarities that you can take. And it's uh, it's, I I did it with uh, a partnership with polarity partnership. And I also on the debrief document uh, give people resources if they want to design their own polarity maps and they Mm -hmm. want to have their whole family take a polarity map. There are resources where you could actually engage in constructing your own polarity map. And because each polarity map is unique to each family. There's no such thing as one polarity map for reveal and conceal or invest and harvest. Every family's polarity map is going to be really unique to their family. Um, so uh, there is actually a resource. <laughs> to okay, help got it. So thank you for the for the tip, yeah. Could be a good activity for kind of a normal, normally scheduled family meeting. Uh, just yes. an educational component. Yeah, Absolutely. That'd be good. Um, tell us a little bit about unorthodox power, and then we'll we'll move on to some other some other concepts. Um, I actually kind of crunched a bunch of other really weird power dynamics into this unorthodox power chapter, and the three that I highlight are I call circular power, elder power, and blocking power, and I'll describe them briefly. So, circular power. This is one of my favorite clients. She um she was uh, selected. She's the youngest of three daughters. And her father, it's a multi-billion dollar business. And the father really wanted one of his three daughters to succeed him as CEO. And so they hired a fantastic consulting firm and they evaluated the three. And after a two-year analysis, they decided that she 
was going to be the successor. So suddenly she became the boss of her two sisters, which violated all the family norms, right? Because yeah. not only are they siblings, which implies equality, but she was also the youngest. So in the in the family hierarchy, she was the youngest and suddenly she became the boss. In addition to that, and that created all kinds of dynamics in the sibling group. In addition to that, this daughter reported to the board and the board was made up of her father, her two sisters and herself. So it was this very strange, like her sisters reported to her and she reported to her sisters. That doesn't happen outside of family business. That happens all the time in family business, right? So this circular power dynamic makes the case for governance to be so different in a family business. Um, Elder deference power. We've all seen this. I love this story. Um, This one family was really struggling with uh, equal pay versus market pay. And for years, they'd been in equal pay and was creating all sorts of resentment all over the place. So for two years, the CEO, um, who had succeeded his father and had been in the role for quite a while, talked with the family, hired consultants, negotiated this really robust market compensation that included an end of year bonus. And finally, the year ended and the family came together and they started to have the conversation about how to allocate the bonus. And the dad said, I just don't want to do it. We're just going to pay them all equally. We're just going to do it equal. He couldn't tolerate the discomfort of the conflict and in creating some new dynamics. So the the power of and the father is long gone from the role, no longer an owner, uh, no longer the, the CEO, not even sitting on the board yet. In the family rules, you defer to your elders, right? So when the family mindset is in play, you've got this competing commitment of what's right. And then the last one is this concept of blocking power. And this is a really unique form of power that shows up in a family business. Imagine you've seen this probably as well. You've got a a new shareholder agreement and you need everyone in the family to sign the shareholder Mm -hmm. agreement that makes some really important changes and improvements. And then there's the one person who just won't sign. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's 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 going to keep asking, well, I'm not sure about this. And I want to I'm going to rethink that. And and this goes on and on and on and on. And it's this this power. Nobody can make any progress until this document is signed. There's all sorts of anxiety that starts to edge up because people really want the document to be signed. But one person won't sign the document and it can cause real strain in the family. Um, And there's some value to it though. Like all of these different sources of power have value. The one upside of of this power is that it really slows things down and you get a chance to think, well, we all kind of think this way, but she's thinking something different. Is there something of value that we need to listen to? Because if everyone else thinks something different, maybe there's a polarity in play and she's actually bringing the countervailing force that's needed and important. And another re- another thing that could be in play is she really wants to be heard. And she's sort of the designated difficult one. And there she goes again. And she's always causing problems. And, and I, I came across this, um, this African proverb, which I love. And I think it describes this dynamic really, really well. And then the importance of listening to these people who aren't being heard. And the, it, the proverb goes like this, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. I mean, I get emotional every time I think about that. Mm -hmm. A child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. (laughs) I mean, that's just a really, I think it's a very profound thing. So yes, so that is my encapsulation of unorthodox power. (laughs) Well, I'll I'll lighten the moment again. And you've just given me, you've just given me new language for the designated difficult one in my family. (laughs) We're going to talk about it tonight at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. Um, you talk about the polarity of uh, privileges and responsibilities. I was fascinated with this one because, you know, I think we we think about well, I'm the res- I'm the responsible one, and I'm not privileged. And how you talk about in the book how that can actually get out of whack too if if you're taking more than you should or. Tell us a little bit about that polarity, privileges and responsibilities. This is one that really resonates deeply with me because I uh, I now hold privileges and responsibilities as a polarity. And before I held responsibilities as the only way to be. Yeah. And so I, in my family system, 
was the hyper responsible one. And I overperformed for everybody and I took care of everybody. And I was sort of the protector and the hero. And I thought it was the right thing for me to do to be responsible. And I didn't see, I couldn't see the overuse of responsible. I thought like there's only goodness in being responsible. And then I, when I, once I held it as a polarity, I saw, oh, wow. Okay. I get it. I, the overuse of privilege is entitlement. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do, because these poll preferences that everybody has poll preferences, our preferences come from an aversion to the overuse of the opposite pole. So my preference for responsibility is because I really don't want to be known as entitled. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, the media has portrayed family business brats as entitled brats. Look at all, look at Dallas in the, you know, eighties mm -hmm. succession in the 2020s. So there's such a, um, a negative stereotype with uh, heirs in family businesses. And so once you frame it as the overuse of privilege, then that forced me to think about well, what are the benefits of privilege? And then what's the overuse of responsibility? And it took me a while. To, I still kind of struggle with that question. Like the benefits of privilege are, oh gosh, there are some really cool benefits. There are some amazing benefits to privilege and I don't use them because I'm so scared people are going to think I'm that bad person over there. And what's the overuses of responsibility? And I looked at my life and I'm like, oh my God, no wonder I'm exhausted. And I'm burnt out and I'm constantly trying to protect everybody. <laughs> and I am way in the overuse of responsibility. And what I really found interesting in my research for the book is far more often do I see family business leaders in the overuse of responsibility than in the overuse of privilege. Now, it, it's quite possible that the ones who are in the overuse of privilege aren't looking for coaches. Nevertheless, and there are there's plenty of um, there's plenty of uh, of entitlement out there. But what I also found is that quite often, what looks like entitlement actually isn't entitlement at all. There are some other factors that are in play that make it look like there's entitlement going on when it's actually something completely different that's happening. Yeah. So I like to think of privileges and responsibilities as um, pairing well, like wine and dark chocolate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like when you, it's sort of the, the leadership polarity of support and challenge. If you're going to challenge your team with really high standards, then support them so that you, they've got the resources to achieve them, right? They uh, support and challenge, I think, work well together. If you're not going to challenge them much, you don't have to support them much. If you're going to challenge them a lot, support them a lot. I think privileges and responsibilities, I hold them very similarly. If you're going to take a lot of privilege, then take on the corresponding responsibility. And if you're going to take on the responsibility, then take some of the privilege that goes along with it. And it allows for a much more harmonious integration of these opposing forces so that you're not falling into the overuse of either one. One of the polarities, and I didn't have the language before I read your book, but one of the polarities I'm constantly visiting with families about, and, and mostly senior leaders, is um, continuity and control. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Basically, I'm telling them oftentimes out of one side of your mouth, you're saying continuity is everything. And the continuity of this business means the world to us when out of the other side of their mouth, their, their, act, or their actions are showing that control is really what they're fully invested in. Um, any thoughts on that as a polarity? Sorry, this was not in the pre-call, but continuity and control as a, as a polarity. Any thoughts on just, I guess how to have conversation around it? Uh, yes. So this is sort of a random idea that I was thinking about yesterday and I'm going to, I'm going to riff. Let's riff. You, you riff. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do both it. Riff. So when we're parents and we're raising our children, we have a child who is totally helpless and we do everything for them. Like we change their diapers. Right. And then over time they start to take on more responsibility. They start wearing proper underpants and they might mess up and they might wet the bed and stuff, but, and then they become teenagers and then they start to get a little bit more independence and they, maybe they get a car and then they're going to crash the car. And, <laughs> and then it's just a matter of, uh, over time you, you take your, you, you take 
less responsibility for them as they take more responsibility for themselves. It's a transition mm -hmm. over time. And for some reason, the business mindset leaves us with this, this belief that we're supposed to take a baton and pass it in a family business. And I think that baton passing concept, like you might pass the baton. It's too abrupt. It's too yeah. jarring. Yeah, right. Yeah. So can't we bring a more nuanced transition over time to this transition from one leader to another leader? And couldn't we do it a little bit similarly to how we raise our children? Can we share some responsibility, support them when they stumble, right? When they, when they yeah. crash the car um, and then give them some more responsibility and, and do the same sort of thing over time. Now that may not be the right answer for every family, but it's a much more uh, harmonious way to hold the tension between what I call sooner and later is that this yeah. leading generation tension and then the rising generation tension, which is urgent and patient. Uh, so um, I think this continuity control uh, question is a really um, interesting one. I haven't framed it. And I've never held that as a polarity before, but I can see how it could invite that conversation. And if you're able to literally map it out, put those four quadrants, put the words in the quadrants, and then sit back as a family and say, okay, how can we get some of the benefits of continuity here and some of the benefits of control so that we have a really successful transition in the long run? And one of the things that I like to invite people to do, and I mentioned this in the book, is fat, it, it is now 2044. So fast forward 20 years, it is July 25th of 2044, and you had a marvelous succession. It was just brilliant. What did you do in... 2024, 2025, 2026, et cetera, in the last 20 years that set up that marvelous transition? What's the outcome that you got that you loved? Another way to do it is it's 2044 and it was a disaster. <laughs> what did you do or not do over the past 20 years that led to this bad outcome? And that distance, that that literally taking your soul forward and looking back can, can reframe how you hold this tension. Well, it's safer. It's safer to think about right. rather than right now, right here, right now. I mean, this conversation for me is so important. I, I have a son that just got home from a two-year service church service mission, and I'm dealing with this now. Like, now he's going to live under my roof for six weeks, and this whole okay, he was on his own, doing just fine, um, and now am I going to try to exert some control? Uh, you know, so anyways, selfishly, well, this is an important conversation. Ah, I mean, you're bringing up a great polarity, which is he's used to me and now he's got to deal with a we, right? You're mm -hmm. used to you and now you've got to deal with an us, <laughs> right? So there's going to be some system adjustment that goes on as yes. you saw all this autonomy and suddenly he's sharing space with other people and there may be some opportunity to renegotiate what are the boundaries of the relationship given the new dynamics. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause because I want to not hog all of the, your value. So um, I want to encourage the audience now to start submitting questions in the chat so that we can um, invite your voice to the call. I'll ask one more question and then um, I'll go to the chat and then we'll, I'll have you raise your hands and we'll, We'll invite you into the to the conversation. Um, you talk a little bit about well, governance obviously is is huge with family businesses and gets a lot of attention. Um, as we think about governance structures and and how to set those up and provide guidelines for shared ownership and shared decisions, um, what polarities should we be aware of there? And I was thinking you know, the kind of the top down, bottom up structure versus flexibility. And you also mentioned me versus we, but just thinking about governance, what are some of the polarities that immediately kind of come to mind and what should we be aware of? Yeah. So the top down, I'll, I'll take top down, bottom up, I'll take structure and flexibility and I'll okay. raise you an include exclude. How's that? <laughs> okay. That sounds good. All right. Um, so top down and bottom up, when we're crafting governance structures, it's very tempting for the leading generation to, to be Moses and say, this is how it's going to be. And they kind of craft. And there's really value, great value in getting 
input from the rising generation. The rising generation is going to live with these governance structures. It's really helpful to get that perspective. So how can you actually get the best of both top down and bottom up? There are some things that are just going to be top, top down, period. End of story. Uh, and, and that's OK. Uh, there are some uh, times that getting the input from the rising generation who's going to have to handle the outcome can be really important. Um, structure and flexibility. My favorite example of this is the family employment policy. Yeah. So we have a family employment policy. You need five years of work in an MBA before you can work in the business. And then an in-law comes and comes and has 20 years of experience and has a CPA, not an MBA. Yeah. And so then, well, like, do you follow the letter of the law or do you allow for some flexibility given the really unique dynamic and, and situation that you have at hand? If you're going to stick to structure, this new in-law is not eligible. If you allow for flexibility, uh, you know, that's when you can say, you know what, there's a, in service to our greater purpose and service to our aspiration, we're going to hold the stru the, hold the tension between structure and flexibility in a different way. And we're going to allow for Susie to come in and be the CFO of the business. So and then the last one that I like also is include exclude. And this is related to married ins. So when an in-law does, when someone does marry into the family, quite often the question is, um, well, gosh, will they become owners in the business? And the often answer is no bloodline. Mm -hmm. and another question is, do they participate in the meetings? Yeah. Do they join the family for these family conversations? And that's a that's a, often a very emotional conversation. Uh, and when you, again, hold it as a polarity, you can change the question from should we include or exclude, but how do we get the benefits of inclusion? How do we get the benefits of exclusion? What creative brainstorming can we come together with as a family that harmonizes those things? So we've got some of both and we're not stuck in this either or kind of mindset. Yeah, the, the, the include and exclude is an interesting one. And there's a there's a family that I work with that kind of found that found happy ground with um, voices and votes. So what they do is they, they wanted to be inclusive on the voices because they see the value of, of all. And they want, they don't want filters between what happens in a meeting and what happens, you know, the, the message that gets home. So they wanted to, they wanted to have them involved, but they also wanted to keep some control. So they include all voices, but they made it clear that these seven people are going to have votes. So right. I th I found that really humane. Yeah. It's a beautiful way to harmonize <laughs> yeah. the benefits of both. That's a great yeah. example. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, so we do have a question. Um, Wendy, if, would you be willing to take yourself off mute and ask your question about uh, outside perspective? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering in these dynamic situations, I mean, we're going through so many exponential rates of change in all industries and it impacts family office. And I think even more so the gap between top and bottom, you know, generations when you're trying to meet in the middle. Um, how often do you see or is there benefit to getting a third party perspective, you know, brought in to these situations to help I guess, clarify potential issues and headwinds for, for a family. Yes, Wendy, I think it's really helpful to bring in people who have an appreciation and understanding of how polarities work because you're normalizing both truths. When you, in the absence of having that third party, you get uh, people arguing their individual truths and the polarity thinking can honor both truths and everyone can feel validated. And it, that person can help bring the family to a more, uh, I guess, a broader understanding. It's like they can only see half of the, the coin. They can't see the other half. And the the third party is neutral. They don't have a dog in your fight. So yes, I love that. It's that, that idea by all means, bring in someone who actually can structure the conversation in the form of a polarity. So the family's able to get a little bit higher on the balcony and see the bigger picture. Thank you. And I would just, I would just add, Wendy, I mean, you're, you're not bringing in an outsider to have answers, you're typically bringing in an outsider to maybe ask hard questions or to just bring different, uh, you know, a different lens. I think we get, I get pushback sometimes from family business leaders where it's like, well, 
an outsider wouldn't understand us. An outsider wouldn't understand our family dynamic. We're, we're unique. I've heard of the, you know, you, our family's a little unique, Wendy. Um, and, and then also just the business. I mean, I, I think of people that have been successful in running their businesses and it does not mean that they've been successful necessarily on navigating generational transition or, you know, setting up some of these governance structures. And and we shouldn't expect them to be great at it because if it's the first time they're doing it, um, the likelihood is that there's going to be some learning along the way. That's Thank it. you. All right. Um, thanks for getting us started. I wanted to see if there was anyone that wanted to raise your virtual or real hand and ask another question. I don't see any others necessarily in the chat. Anyone have a question for Kathy or I? Steve, go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Hi, Kathy. Um, my question is about the word polarities. And somebody put in the chat there, this is the first time I've heard the word polarities. And I understand it because I've heard it a number of times and we've talked about it. But do you find that that it's easy to get people to get on board? Or I, I love that. I also like, Dave, your your first explanation about the inhale, inhale exhale. I'd never thought of that one. Like, how many examples do you have to give people of what it means before they get it? Um, so a polarity is a, a modern word for paradox duality, dichotomy, yin-yang. I mean, th this concept has been around since the beginning of time. Uh, is there a beginning of time? Separate issue. Um, <laughs> but- uh, There's polarity on that. <laughs> right. Yeah, great point. Well said. Um, uh, so yes, this concept has been around forever. It was Barry Johnson in the 1970s who- uh, framed the or use the word polarity. And he's the sort of the grandfather of this concept of polarity thinking. Uh, but it is the, the, this concept of independent opposites is, is literally infinite. Um, yeah. So, uh, and what was this? You had a second question. Well, no, it was just about like how many examples, like, so, so oh, I yeah. guess the, the yeah. examples, yeah, the examples. eventually somebody gets it. Right. Light bulb. It's, it's, When's the, yeah. When does the light bulb go on? When does the light bulb go off? Uh, it, it actually takes some time because our brains are so wired for either or. It's not a nat, like once you get it, it's like you kind of hang on by the edge and then you kind of step into it a little bit more. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, there are. You see them everywhere. You see them everywhere. You can't, you can't not see them after a while. And uh, the clue here, there are two ways that I, that, that it became really clear to me. The first one was when somebody said something and I'd say, what? What on earth are they? How on earth could someone think that? And then I'd realize, oh, I wonder if that's a polarity and I'm blind to the other side of the pole. So I would, once I started to, to get really judgy about someone, I would check myself and say, wait, is there, am I, what am I missing about this? The second way was anytime I heard the word or, I would say, oh, polarity or not, polarity or not, right? Apples and oranges, not a polarity. Support and challenge, polarity. Task and relationship, polarity. Accommodating, demanding, polarity. Bold, humble, candid, diplomatic. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in leadership, and it's just uh, a, a, it abounds in family business. And I love we need your polarity work. practice. We need polarity practice, Steve. Yes, yeah. but what what but we need. Kathy? What you know? You were talking about how you're hyper responsible, and you couldn't see how there that could have a negative, right? I'm one of those too. And it, like eventually, you realize, wait a sec, there's there's a too much, and there is going too far. So if if we, as we explain these things, can talk about the ways that that we've learned from them, and and how that we have recognize some of our limitations. I think that can be helpful too. Yeah. Well said, Steve. Yeah. And I, those are the two ways that I have found it to be really helpful. I'm sure there are other ways out there as well, but yeah, it does take time. It's the brain kind of has to reorganize itself to be open to this possibility because we're so deeply wired for either or. And that's why when we come in, we come into a family, we have to realize that some people will get it quickly and others will take a little longer. So we have to be willing to normalize the fact that we get it, but that it's going to take them time to understand. But once one of them gets it, it can become contagious, hopefully. Yeah, another polarity.
quick and slow. St- yeah, Steve, I love what you said there, though, with, um, you know, vulnerability. As we are trying to teach others about polarities, um, I think us going first on our own vulnerabilities about this is this is an issue that I saw in this way. And as I learned about polarities, I was able to see that that's what was happening to me. And this is kind of how it impacted me. I, I just think that if we're vulnerable and if we're human, um, you know, it invites others to join us in that, you know, in that vulnerability. And that fits exactly with what you were talking about of people who don't want to bring in an outsider because they think, you know, they won't get us. So when we have that opportunity to get and sit in front of a, of a room with all the people who have the same last name except me, we have to know how to act to make them comfortable so that they don't regret that they brought somebody in. And so yeah. going first with the vulnerability is a big part of that. Anyway, thank you. Steve. Thanks. See you next week, Kathy. Chloe, um, do you want to take yourself off mute? You have a question? Hi, thank you, Dave. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Chloe. So to give some context, I entered my family business and then I left. And since that point in time, I've been renegotiating with my family. What does it mean to be a part of this family? And what does it mean to be a part of the business? Because at first I thought, now I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business at all. I'm only a family member. But in your experience, what role do family members play, even if they, when they're not in the business, what role do they still play and how do they continue to impact that business? Well, that's every family's unique. Every family business is unique. It's hard for me to say that there's one right answer in that tension. Uh, but what I'm interested to, to, to see more about is, um, what's your ownership? What's your, uh, board level influence? What's your stewardship mindset? Like what are the, if you're a a member of the family, but you don't own any part of the business, that might be a different answer than if you're a member of the family and you're an owner of the business and you're not working in the business. Um, what's the tension between, here's a, another really challenge, two really challenging polarities. There's dependent and independent And then there's also independent and interdependent. So I'm sorry, I'm I'm probably getting super wonky, but let's stick with the second one, the independent and interdependent. You are an independent woman, right? Mm -hmm. You have a, 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 a place in this world, right? And in your family business, there's an interdependency because you have a shared asset. And so the decisions that you make affect other members of the family in the business and vice versa. And, there's a weird human polarity that's connected to this. And that is a simultaneous deep desire to belong and be autonomous and independent. We, we desperately want to be a part of our family. We want to belong. We want to be in relationship and community with our families, family members. And we want the freedom and the autonomy and the independence to do whatever we want. And Mm -hmm. that tension is a really hard one to manage as well. And that's the one I'm hearing is this, this really sort of autonomy belonging kind of tension, but I'm I'm not sure. Maybe we can talk offline and and explore more. (laughs) Yeah, that would be wonderful. I know it's like, it's so, it's so dependent on every family is unique. My family is different. So I'm sure that that makes a big difference in, you know, what polarities are coming into play or what roles come into play. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Chloe. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone else want to raise their hand and uh, ask a question to Kathy? If not, I have other questions. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's see. Okay. So I guess what I want to kind of conclude with is this the takeaway for me is from the book and from this conversation is just the ability to redefine and reimagine problems as polarities a total game changer not only in family business but in our relationships with others uh, whether it's our siblings or a spouse um if we can do some polarity practice this week and just identify how we see the world and and see if there are some polarities that we're dealing with there, I think we can show up with a lot more empathy. I think we'll probably have more friends, Kathy. I think I think people will like like being around us more 
if we're aware of the polarities um, that are that are in our daily lives. Um, any final thoughts or comments um, on anything that we've talked about? Or I know we just scratched the surface on the book, but Kathy, I'll I'll leave you with some final words. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in just to riff off your practice, uh, if you if anyone is in a committed relationship where you have uh, combined finances, one of the really common polarities in marriages and in other partnerships is the spend save polarity. It's quite often that one member, one spouse prefers to spend, one spouse prefers to save. If that's true for you, that would be a wonderful place to practice polarity thinking. <laughs> um, but really to, to zoom out, um, polarity thinking requires just a tick more complexity than we're comfortable with. We just need to slow down just enough to wrap our head around four different things, right? Our brains hold three things pretty well, but if I have four things at the grocery store, I need a list, right? So polarity thinking necessitates just a tick more patience and complexity than we're accustomed to using. So slow down to go fast, take the time to do it. It's worthwhile to transcend the distance in your head and to come up with creative uh, solutions and develop the capacity to hold these tensions because they don't go away. They're always going to be there because they're not solvable. They're tensions to manage. I love it. Great concluding thoughts. Um, I would, I'm going to share my screen one more time, but as I'm doing so, I would just encourage each of you to make an investment in yourself and um, in the relationships that you have and go, go pick up Hug of War and read it and then, uh, and then teach someone else about polarities. I think the learning that we have is when we teach someone else. So that, that, would, be my, that would be my final invitation about Hug of War. Kathy, thanks so much for, for joining me. I, I just want to um, say we have a couple of other authors that are coming up and I want to just highlight them real quick. Um, next month, we'll have Stephen Goldbart uh, Stacy Allred and Joan DeFuria, and we'll be talking about their 10 by 10 learning roadmap, advancing flourishing in families of wealth. That'll be on August 15th. Um, we have Bo Burlingham and uh, Paul Spiegelman coming to talk about small giants. This is not a new book. I think it's 15 or more years old. Um, we're going to revisit it. Uh, many family businesses have chosen to be small giants. Some great concepts in that book. And then in September, we'll have Sudev Sheth, um, come on and talk about his new book called Bank Rolling Empire, Family Fortunes and Political Transformation in Mughal India. Um, never a dull moment on authors at Drucker. I'm so grateful to be able to host these conversations and mostly grateful for you guys for investing your time with us today. So Kathy, again, thank you to you and thank you to each of our, um, our folks attending today. Make it a great week and uh, go get some polarity practice in. Mm -hmm. See you guys.